chips. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to focus today on the uh, first example uh, that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, so we are going to be doing constructions of Hecke eigenschiefs for eigenvalues which are <coughs> flat bundles uh, on, you can think about them as being flat bundles with uh, um, uh, 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 with uh, uh, with connections uh, so with, with logarithmic connections on um, on a curve of genus uh, uh, five quarters, which uh, for practical purposes today will mean that we are dealing with uh, tamely ratified parabolic guys on the projective line with ramification at five points. So, so, this, uh, so this is the story of Hecke eigenschiefs on a Del Pezzo surface. The moduli space happened to be a particular Del Pezzo surface. So let me remind you what the setup was. So C is going to be just P1, but I'm still going to be calling it C. Uh, and then the parabolic divisor on C, which is going to be a fixed divisor, is going to consist of five distinct points, which I'm going to label P1 through P5. And uh, I'm going to look at the module I. Um, of uh, stable or, say, semi-stable uh, parabolic um, <clears throat> rank 2 vector bundles on this pair. <clears throat> and um, I know you've You've heard a lot about parabolic objects last week, uh, but just to fix my conventions, uh, let me just say uh, how I'm going to label my parabolic bundles. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, so his, the, this is my convention. Uh, so if I have a variety X, uh, with some parabolic divisor on it, which I'm assuming normal crossings, um, uh, then uh, a parabolic vector bundle uh, on this data, um, this is normal crossings, Uh, is going to be a family um, <clears throat> let's call it uh, E sub dot of locally free sheaves on X <clears throat> uh, labeled by dot, which is going to be an assignment of a real number to each component of the divisor. So the set of components of uh, the parabolic divisor is mapped to the dots. And so this dot guy, uh, and so these guys should satisfy the usual properties, so uh, E of A is 
contained in E of A prime if A is less than or equal to A prime, uh, where the order is just the order of the values. Uh, and uh, these guys are upper semi-continuous, so E of A plus epsilon is, is equal to E of A for a collection of real numbers that's small. And shifting by an integer in any of the um, uh, in any of the components of the divisor, so E of A plus delta I uh, is equal to E of A tensored with the component delta I. So this just means the parabolic divisor here is D1 plus DK. And um, yeah, so this is my convention. Um, and again, the standard terminology uh, is that these uh, labels are called parabolic levels. And uh, the points uh, where these bundles actually jump, right? So they're upper semi-continuous, so they jump at finitely many points in any interval of length one. Those points are the parabolic weights. Uh, and I'm going to choose an interval of length one where my parabolic weights are going to live, and it's going to be the interval between minus one and zero. So the jumps uh, the jump values of dot of e dot, well, the jump values of dot for jumping of E dot in the interval uh, minus 1 to 0 to the K are the parabolic weights. So there is some ambiguity of how you label your weights, so this is how I'm going to be labeling them. Um, um, <clears throat> and um, <sighs> you mean one with levels, uh, one with, with, with families? Um, <clears throat> there is, uh, but it is not a uh, uh, um, Uh, it, it, it's, it's much subtler when the structure group changes because um, um, I mean, what you have to do is, right, you, you need to do some Tanakian argument. You want to look at the category of, uh, of, uh, of guys like that uh, and uh, with their natural tensor structure and then specify a particular fiber functor to select the guys that correspond to the principal bundles and then you want to interpret them in terms of that data. And uh, <clears throat> you get more than parabolic guys this way, you get the parahoric guys. Uh, so the, the, the way you want to describe the structure is kind of subtle. So uh, <clears throat> I actually don't know if it's done in complete generality, maybe in the uh, uh or is it only done for curves, uh, like this family description for principal bundles. The Tanakian, yes, but if you want to get it in terms of loop groups, uh, to have a local family of representations of the loop group. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there is a... Okay, the answer is I don't know if... if, uh, if. <clears throat> Uh, but, yeah, one thing I want to say, uh, um, uh, which is uh, 
going to be, I, I'm going to be using it all the time, uh, so I want to introduce this notation. <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm right now talking about the general parabolic conventions, so I, I don't know if, uh, if you heard about that last week, but let me, uh, uh, let me introduce this notion, uh, Muchizuki's notion of, 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 uh, of a bundle being locally abelian. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, um, a parabolic bundle is called locally abelian if locally on X with the parabolic divisor X, uh, it is a direct sum of parabolic line bundles. So this is, uh, so these are the guys that you need to fit in the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. Locally abelian parabolic bundles with, with uh, flat connections or with Higgs bundles. Um, and, um, and so everything, so on curves that's a vacuous condition, but in higher dimensions it's an actual condition. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and so, I'm not going to be saying locally abelian everything that, that, that we'll be constructing, seeing in the picture, it's going to be always locally abelian. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I just want to introduce the notation. So this, this is just a side remark, but an important one, uh, which is that parabolic line bundles are very easy to describe and they're just really corresponding to real divisors. Um, so a parabolic line bundle, so if uh, if we choose a collection of real numbers uh, d1 through dk uh, for each component of the divisor, then uh, we get a parabolic line bundle I'm going to call it O of x uh, d1 times d1 was dk times dk, uh, where the level A value of this parabolic line bundle is, by definition, the shifts of the real numbers by the level and then uh, uh, the minimal integer, uh, the, the integral part of those shifts. So if you're dealing with a divisor with rational coefficients or a real divisor, a real element in the Picard, um, you can interpret those as parabolic line bundles in, in this manner. So this obviously satisfies all the, uh, all the properties we are uh, discussing. And um, uh, so, by the way, so, so I'm going to write this. Uh, um, as O of x d times R of x. So I'm always going to think about this uh, coefficient vectors as uh, being row vectors and the vector of divisors as being a column vector and just multiply them this way. Yeah. I just mean at each point of x there is a neighborhood so you know if it's far away from the divisor it doesn't matter nothing happens and it's near the divisor there's a neighborhood uh, uh, where the bundle is isomorphic to a direct sum of these things. Well, in fact, well, this is one type of parabolic line bundles. And so the remark that I wanted to make is uh, every parabolic line bundle is isomorphic to something of this form, maybe up to a twist with an ordinary line bundle. or some vector d in r to the d, r to the k, and some l 
which is just an ordinary one. For me. So was the local labeling condition clear? Yes, yes. So yeah, let me just say what this thing really means. So if you write down parabolic bundles in the usual way as a bundle together with filtrations uh, on the restriction of the bundle on the components of the divisor, uh, what this condition ensures is that if you look at the associated gradients for those filtrations, so you have one for each component of the divisor, but if you have intersections of the components of the divisor, you can have, you have several filtrations coming from each component coming into that intersection, and you can look at the associated gradient in all possible orders. So what this condition means, it's actually equivalent to saying that all those associated gradients do not depend on the order. But uh, uh, thinking about it this way, it's, it's, it's actually a, 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 bit, uh, a, a, a bit more uh, manageable and useful. Okay, so, uh, so, so all the parabolic bundles that we're dealing with are going to be locally abelian. Um, and uh, so this is my convention for labeling the weights. And now... <clears throat> Let me go back to the moduli problem that I was discussing. So, um, So, so, so we'll, we'll look at the moduli problem for parabolic bundles on P1 with five points with fixed uh, parabolic structure, which means a fixed collection of weights. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so the moduli of semi-stable parabolic rank two bundles Uh, um, on P1, well, on C with the parabolic divisor C, which is the five points, uh, uh, depends, it has many components, uh, and these depend on uh, invariants. And uh, so you can label your invariants any way you want. Uh, I'm going to label my invariants as um, 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 uh, so if I have a parabolic bundle, I'm going to say that one invariant is the topological invariant of one level, which I'm going to take the zero level. Uh, and then the other invariant are going to be the parabolic weights. Now, because th th these are rank two, and uh, it's a length two flag, there are two weights attached to each point. So there are two jump jumping points in the interval minus one, zero for each of the five points. So I'm going to say minus one between, uh, OK. I don't want to introduce this notation because I'm not going to use the weights. I'm going to use something different to label things later on. Um, let's call it A1, AI, BI. Um, <clears throat> so I goes from 1 to 5. And so if you look at this moduli space, I'm going to call it for now burn. Uh, so let's call this D. So it depends on D and on these numbers. Um, this moduli space, um, so OK, so there is a, is a discrete parameter, which is D. And then there is this continuous parameter, which is living in minus 1. 0 to the tenth. Um, and this uh, depends um, um, 
on A and B, also in kind of uh, uh, discreetly, uh, uh, it, there is a chamber structure. Uh, so in fact, what happens is uh, uh, burn D A B depends only on the difference. It's a space. Uh, and in the space of differences, uh, so this is the space parameterizing B minus A. Well, this is now between 0 and 1. Uh, Uh, there is a chamber structure, and so the space doesn't depend on the particular collection of weights. It only depends on the chamber in which that collection of weights lands. And, I mean, this is not very illuminating, so I'm not going to go into details, but let me just say, uh, so in this space, there are four chambers. And uh, they're, in fact, ordered. Uh, and I'm just going to say what the answer is. The corresponding moduli are in the lowest chamber, they're empty. In the next chamber, uh, they are uh, DP4. So this is going to be a P2 blown up at four points. I'm going to say which one. It's actually a particular DP4. In the next chamber, it's a DP5. And in the next chamber, it's a P2. So these are all possible moduli spaces you can get. And again, uh, there are really no moduli. They, uh, these DP4 and these DP5 are fixed. So let me, in fact, say what they are. Um, so the P2 is just the symmetric, second symmetric product of C. C is a P1, and its second symmetric product is a plane. The DP5 is the blow-up of this second symmetric product of C at the five points P1 through P5, where P1 through P5 sit inside C, which is embedded in the second symmetric product diagonally. So you have this plane, which is the second symmetric product of C, C sits inside naturally as a conic. The, the, the diagonal embedding of P1 in the second symmetric product of C2 is a quadratic embedding, so it's a conic. And then you have the five points on that C, where the parabolic structure is specified. Uh, there are five points on that conic, and then you need to blow them up. That's the DP5. And the DP4 is this guy with the conic blown down. So here are these exceptional divisors. And now, you know, the conic which started at something with self-intersection 4, once you blow up five points on it, it has self-intersection minus 1, and you can blow it down to a smooth point. And so the DP4 is the DP5 with the strict transform of the conic blow down. So this is a typical variation of GIT picture. Uh, you start with a P2, you move in the chamber structure, you have to blow up five points. So you get a birational model of the moduli space. Then you move further in the chamber structure. You have to 
blow down something, and then it becomes empty. So, so there, you know, the, 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 all those moduli spaces are birational, uh, and the biggest one is this one. Since in this uh, 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 strategy, uh, which converts the question on the stacks to a question on spaces by using the extension theorem and non-abelian Koch theory, we have a choice of a birational model of the space. Uh, and, you know, we need to arrange things so that non-abelian Koch theory works, which means that the space has to be nice, you know, it has to be non-singular away from co-dimension 3 and compact, uh, and also uh, the divisor where the parabolic structure will be uh, prescribed has to be normal crossings. We always have this freedom of choosing birational models, and we can keep blowing up uh, in those birational models to make things nice. So, uh, so I'm just going to choose the biggest one here. We may still have to blow up that further, but I'm just going to start with this guy. Um, because everything else is uh, dominated by it. So we'll work with the generic chamber. Generic is the biggest one, where the module i is the DP5. And I'm going to just denote it by x. <laughs> so one peculiar feature of, so this was, I didn't say which, uh, which D we took. Um, so this was just for some D. And one peculiar feature is that uh, the chamber structure, of course, depends on D. Uh, but the, the answers for the different, there are four chambers for all possible Ds. In fact, there are two possible Ds, right? Because there is equal zero and D equal one. Uh, and uh, uh, everything else is determined by parity. So for every even degree, the moduli spaces depend only on the fact that they're even, and uh, for every odd degree, they depend only on the fact that they're odd. So there are four chambers for the even guys, there are four chambers for the odd guys. There are different chambers in the space of parabolic weights, but the answers for the four chambers are the same. And when... Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I can, I can tell you, so, so the, 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 I mean, yeah, the numbers are not really uh, 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 illuminating, but, <laughs> so one thing you can notice is that, so you have this five-dimensional cube, uh, and uh, there is a diagonal in that cube, the big diagonal, and it actually intersects all chambers. So this is by assigning the weights at all the points to be equal. Uh, so, so you really have one parameter. And you can say exactly what the chambers are. Uh, as I said, it's not very... Um, uh, so the chambers are uh, zero to two-fifths, two-thirds, two-fifths to two-thirds, and two-thirds to one. Yeah, this is the difference between A and B. So this is the... <coughs> Sorry, I'm missing something. So this is 0 to 2 fifths. This is 2 fifths to 2 thirds. This is 2 thirds to 4 fifths. two-thirds to four-fifths, and this is four-fifths to one. <laughs> uh, but in particular, you know, the balance chamber is... is uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I wrote the guys for degree z one. Uh, if you write the guys for degree zero, they flip. 
So the Bauer chamber for degree zero corresponds to the DP5. So if you take away it's one half, that would be the DP5 for degree zero. <coughs> um, these are the, the chambers for degree one. Uh, but so the, the point is that um, uh, because this is a particular phenomenon for this modular space when uh, 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 when we have five points, um, and um, the, 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 because it's an odd number of points, the degree zero and the degree one modular space are actually isomorphic uh, for a shift in the weights because you have the freedom of shifting by by the sum of the five points. Uh, so. Uh, so we will work in this smaller chamber, which is the intersection of the DP5 chamber for the degree one guy and the, the DP5 chamber for the degree zero guy. Uh, but in particular, the balance weights are there. So x equals to DP5, uh, pot for d equals zero and one. And one. Uh, pleasant and useful fact in this situation is that uh, every parabolic bundle in X is uh, strictly stable. There are no semi-stable bundles. And uh, <coughs> So this is actually the, the, the real difference between the DP5 and the DP4. In this modular space, there is one parabolic bundle which is semi-stable, which is the one corresponding to the blown-down cone. And when you blow it up and change the parabolic weights, everything there becomes stable. Uh, <clears throat> so you don't have to worry about semi-stability. Everything is stable. Um, and... Um, Uh, and also this uh, gives you bundles of degree 0 and degree 1. So in particular, you can look at the basic Hecke correspondence. So near, uh, 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 so here we are in rank 2. So we have only one generator in the, uh, in the spherical Hecke algebra. So we can look at the basic Hecke correspondence. I'm going to call it Hecke, uh, which goes between, so Hecke, which goes between x and x cross c, uh, but by rationally. I mean, these are rational maps. And uh, this Hecke guy is just the moduli of triples E dot E prime dot at the point X, well, let's call it P, such that P is a point in C, uh, and e, e dot is in X, E prime dot is in X, but in two different interpretations. We think about this X as the module of degree zero parabolic guys, underlying degree zero parabolic guys, and these are the underlying degree one parabolic guys. And these are such that E dot goes to E prime dot, and the difference is just uh, rank one guy supported at the point. And uh, so if you take this space, uh, it's a well-defined moduli space, uh, but the natural maps to the two copies of X are not morphisms in general. So, so you want to take E, E prime, and P, and map it to E, and map it to E prime and P. And uh, uh, the, the, you know, first of all, you get problems where P is one of the parabolic points uh, because there you actually have a choice of this line, whether the line coincides with the parabolic structure or not, with the, the flag in the parabolic structure or not. Um, 
and also uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you do this modification at the point of something stable, you can get something which is not stable, so it may not be in your moduli space. Uh, so, so these are just rational maps. Uh, and so I can formulate now the problem that we are trying to solve, uh, which is the, the result of applying the not and Hodge theory to the original Langlands problem. And the problem is uh, we want to construct uh, Compactification was resolution of this hecky guy, let's call it H, with morphisms resolving these maps so that H is smooth away from co-dimension 3. Um, the free image of the parabolic divisor of X plus the free image of the parabolic divisor of X cross C, which is just the parabolic divisor of X cross C plus the parabolic plus X cross the parabolic divisor of C, this is normal crossings away from co-dimension 3. So you need some very rational model of this Keke correspondence that has these properties that will allow us to, once we solve the problem in the Higgs world, to convert the solution to a D module. So these were necessary conditions uh, in the non-abelian Hodge theory. Uh, but then we need to say what the problem in the Higgs world is. So let me, so I'm continuing with what we want. So we want such a guy. So le let's call this the parabolic divisor of H. And uh, so we want this. Um, and we need a parabolic line bundle. So this is a kernel object. I'm going to call it I, line, line bundle I, such that on H. Okay, I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to talk about the convention. So the first parabolic chunk class of I is 0 in the second cohomology of H. And so th this means that with appropriate Higgs fields, this would correspond to a D module. And such that for every uh, let's say semi stable it's going to be really stable parabolic Higgs bundle uh, e dot theta on C. So this is tamely ramified. So this is logarithmic. So everything will be tamely ramified. Uh, exists a unique, uh, okay, let's say stable so that I don't have to worry about this. For every stable parabolic guy like that, there exists a unique stable parabolic X bundle
uh, f dot phi of x with its parabolic divisor. Uh, and this is again logarithmic. Uh, so that the Hecke eigenshift property holds. And what does it say? It says that Q lower star of P upper star of F dot phi tensor to it I dot with the zero Higgs field is equal to P1 upper star of F dot phi tensor to it P2 upper star of E dot theta. Sorry, so these are stable, but they, they are also, you know, uh, Hodge objects. So this is stable parabolic Higgs bundle with first parabolic chunk class equal to zero. And this is stable parabolic Higgs bundle with first and second parabolic chunk class equal to zero. The modular space is two-dimensional. Well, it doesn't matter. It's always first and second. Okay, so this is what you want. You want a parabolic divisor on X so that, and a birational model of H so that the corresponding parabolic divisor on H is normal crossings. You want a kernel object on the Hecke, on, the, on your birational model, so that for every eigenvalue, which is now a tame parabolic Higgs bundle, you get an eigenshift. <clears throat> And uh, there is one thing I didn't say there, which I tried to explain yesterday, is that I've arranged my problem so that uh, on the Langland side, on the D-module side, uh, the eigenshift problem is twisted uh, by this purely imaginary condition, which on the Higgs side amounts to saying that these guys are not only logarithmic, but have neopotent residues. This is logarithmic with neopotent residues. And this is logarithmic with neopotent residues. And there is maybe one slightly mysterious thing in this formula, uh, which is why did I take the Higgs field on the kernel object to be zero? A priori, from this discussion about the twists yesterday, you, you know that it will have to be with neopotent residues. But, so it's going to be a logarithmic one form on H with pulse on the divisor power H with neopotent residues, but doesn't have to be the zero form. Uh, in fact, in this case, you'll see H is uh, going to be rational. So it has no homomorphic one forms. So neopotent residues automatically will imply that it's zero. But in fact, it's a completely general thing. It has nothing to do with the particular geometry. The problem, the point is that this thing is the Hodge incarnation of the intersection cohomology complex on the stacky Hecke correspondence. The stacky Hecke correspondence is actually smooth in the SL2 case. So uh, the intersection cohomology complex on the stacky Hecke correspondence is just the trivial D module. So the restriction of this guy on the open part of the stacky Hecke correspondence where the maps were morphisms has to be the trivial D module. So that means that the Higgs field has to be zero. There is no choice in that. Anyway, so this is the problem we want to solve. And uh, I'm going to explain to you how to solve it. Uh, the first thing that I haven't told you is what is the parabolic divisor on X? So <laughs> Don't had talked about that last week. Uh, uh, but I, I haven't mentioned it yet, so let me let me say it. So this is again something completely general. The parabolic divisor on X, which is this birational model of the moduli space of bundles that we chose, is the divisor where uh, the discrepancy between the module IF Higgs bundles and the cotangent bundle of the module IF bundles happens. So par X 
is, well, a resolution potentially of the locus in BAM uh, uh, where uh, over which the cotangent bundle to BAM and Higgs differ. So, <clears throat> uh, another, to, another way to say what this is, so, so, so I think Ron explained that last week, but what this locus is, it's the wobbly locus. So this is the locus of all bundles um, with the property that if you look at the fiber of the Hitchin map and you map it to the modular bundles, so the fiber of the Hitchin map is something compact. It maps to the modular bundles, which is something compact. The map is rational. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not proper over certain points inside the modular bundles. So these are the wobbly points. So this is the locus of non-very stable parabolic bundles or wobbly parabolic bundles. And uh, let me just remind you, a bundle or a parabolic bundle E dot is wobbly if it admits a non-zero neopotent Higgs field. Not a, neopot not a Higgs field with neopotent residues, but globally neopotent. No, it's not obvious, so that's a that's actually a consequence of a recent theorem of, uh, of Anna Peon Nieto and uh, Christian Pauli. Uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the, the, yeah, so there is, there is the shaky locus and, and, and the wobbly locus, and they actually do coincide, but that's a theorem. Um, uh, in fact, if you look at their paper, then don't state that, but their proof actually implies it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, in this case, you can actually check it by hand, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll take some words about that. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's the parabolic locus, and so one little theorem that you have to prove here, uh, it's not terribly difficult, but it's tedious, is that uh, uh, the wobbly locus in X is a normal crossings divisor so it is equal to this parabolic divisor that I, I don't need to resolve anything it's it's already as good as it gets, uh, uh, and it's equal to the union of all the lines in this X. Say it again? Yeah, the 16 minus 1 curve. So, so yeah, what lines here means, lines in the anti-canonical embedding of X. So X is a del pezzo surface. The anti-canonical class actually is it into P4, 
this is the linear system minus kx, embeds it into P4, and the image is an intersection of two quadrics. So if you look now at straight lines in P4 contained in that surface, there are 16 of them. So this divisor, the parabolic divisor on X, has 16 components. And uh, you can label those lines uh, in various ways. I'm going to label them maybe for now. Uh, so I is going to be a subset. So it's going to be an element in this labeling set ought. Uh, and this labeling set ought is just subset of ought cardinality. in 1 through 5. You know, so, so this, is, this is just some standard projective geometry uh, thing. <clears throat> um, you can uh, label your lines uh, from the P2 model. Uh, so this, uh, as, as we were just saying, these are just the minus one curves, all the minus one curves inside X, smooth minus one curves inside X, and those correspond in the P2 model to the strict transform of the conic, the five exceptional divisors, and the strict transforms of all the lines through two of the points. Um, <clears throat> and, um, uh, and then uh, you can label them uh, by either subsets in one through five with even cardinality or subsets in 1 through 5 with odd cardinality. So uh, let me just say so that it's, 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 it's completely explicit. Uh, so if I is the empty set, then Li is the strict transform of the conic. Sorry, if I is uh, one of the points, then Li is uh, the exceptional divisor. Uh, for Pi, inside C, inside C into a C. Um, if I is Ijk, then Li is the line through uh, I know, uh, R, S, P, R, and P, S, where R, S is the complementary set. And when I is everything, you get the conic. This is how we label them. And you can, you can also label by even subsets inside 1 through 5, or you can order by uh, <clears throat> even subsets in 1 through 6 module complementation. So these are all equivalent. OK, so this is the shape of the wobbly divisor. So you see, we are constructing, we are supposed to construct for every rank two parabolic Higgs bundle with neopotent residues and uh, logarithmic poles, we are supposed to construct some parabolic Higgs bundle on this del Pezzo surface with neopotent residues on 60 lines so that this Hecke condition is satisfied. Mm. Okay, so at least I said what the parabolic divider on X is. Let me tell you now what H is. 
So that's uh, so. The, 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 this claim is is basically an exercise in projective geometry. This uh, 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 statement about the the, the Barashno model of H, it's actually a hard uh, uh, hard theorem. I mean, you know, it's it's of course it's all basic projective geometry, but this one requires serious thinking. Uh, um, <clears throat> so the theorem. Uh, describes what H is. So H, this is this resolution of the Hecke correspondence that has the nice properties. So it actually has to, it turns out to be smooth. The minimal possible resolution turns out to be smooth. Uh, so this is the minimal resolution of the Hecke correspondence with the desired properties. So smooth in OA co-dimension 3 and, and normal crossings for the parabolic divisor away from co-dimension 3. So this guy turns out to be a blow-up of x cross x. And in fact, it's a completely specific blow-up. First, you need to blow up x cross x in the diagonal. And then you need to blow that up in the strict transform of the surfaces which are a line cross itself. So H compared to X cross X consists of 17 blows, blow ups. First you blow up the diagonal and then take each of those surfaces. This surface, by the way, intersects the diagonal in a divisor. So when you take the strict transform of LI cross LI, it's actually isomorphic to LI cross LI. And all those guys are disjoint in the first blow. So it doesn't matter in what order you're blowing them up. Let me just blow them up. And that's H. And uh, so, so what this really is, it's the moduli space of... Um, mm, lines in P4 contained in a quadric uh, in the pencil defining okay, so this, there is no room here. No, I said here. In fact, so this is the theorem, but let me just explain the meaning of this theorem. So in fact H is the moduli of lines in P4 contained in some quadric, sorry, uh, these are lines in uh, lines through two points. I'm going to say it, lines in P4 contained in some quadric in the pencil defining X. So remember, we said that X is an intersection of two quadrics. So any linear combination of those two quadrics also vanishes on X. So you get a one parameter family of quadrics for which X is the base locus. Uh, and if you look at lines in P4, which are not necessarily contained in X, but are contained in one of those quadrics, uh, you actually get a birational model of the Hecke correspondence. And, uh, and the maps are now obvious. Each such line uh, generically will intersect X at two points. So what, what we're doing is we take two points on X, we take the line through those two points inside P4. Uh, and uh, uh, it is contained in a unique quadric. So it's the map to C. So the parameter space for the pencil which is a P1, is canonically identified with C, with our curve. And this pencil actually has five singular points, five discriminant points. There are five quadrics which are singular, and these five points are exactly the five part parabolic points. So the singular fibers are 
puts it over P1 through P5. And um, um, and the map uh, from from this H to uh, to X cross X cross C is the map that takes you know so like generically a point in here is just two points in X so you take the two points take the line through those two points. So you go to x, y, and then the line through those points is sitting inside a unique quadric in the pencil. So this is the unique quadric containing the line through x and y. And this is birational. Uh, and that's why you need to blow up. So blowing up the diagonal gives you the lines that correspond to two points, right? So you need, you need two infinitesimal linear points, so you need to introduce the tangent lines to X. Uh, there are such lines as well. And then if the points are on a line which is inside X, you need to also blow up those. So that's, that's why you need these two blow ups. And that resolves everything, so this is a morphism. And uh, so now we have these two maps, H mapping to X and H mapping to X cross C. So from this point of view, you know, if you have a point X and a point Y, you map to the point X or to the point Y and the quadric that contains the line X, Y. Mm. So, so in particular, this guy is smooth and four-dimensional. as it should be, because the Hecke correspondence is four-dimensional. The fibers this way are surfaces, the fibers this way are the Hecke lines. Right? So if you, fix, if you fix a vector bundle, a parabolic bundle, and a point on C, you have a P1 worth of modifications that you can perform at that point, because the fiber is two-dimensional, you have all the lines in that fiber. Uh, so the fiber here is that P1. And you know, if, if something happens, if the point becomes a parabolic point or you're on one of the lines, then it, this P1 actually becomes reducible there. It has more components. Uh, so the fibers this way are the Hecke lines. The fibers this way are surfaces. They are actually cubic surfaces. They're the... Uh, uh, yes. So let me just say this. Fibers of Q are the Hecke lines, and the fibers of P are cubic surfaces. They're blobs of P2 at six points. And what they are uh, is uh, <clears throat> if you take the, the, uh, the Delpezzo DP5, X, and you fix a point, the fiber is just the blow-up of X at that point. So that's a blow-up of P2 at six points. So the fiber at the point little x in X is the blow-up of X at X. Generically. So this is all generic. And then there are some degenerations. <clears throat> Okay, uh, you can analyze the parabolic divisor from this point of view. So, um, the parabolic divisor on H uh, has several components. Uh, so it has 16 components that I'm going to denote LPI. It has 16 other components that I'm going to denote LQI. And there are 16 more components that are LLCI. 
And then there are 10 more. Um, R I one and R I two. So a total of fifty eight components. So let me say who is who. So uh, the LLCIs are the easiest guys. So these are just the exceptional divisors. of these blow-ups uh, uh, so, so corresponding to the last blow-ups. So when you blow up Li cross Li, the strict transform, there is an exceptional divisor. It actually turns out to be isomorphic to Li cross Li cross C. So that's why I denoted it by LLCI. Um, the LPI is the strict transform of Li cross X under the blob, and LQI is the strict transform of X cross Li under the blob. And uh, Ri1 union Ri2 is the pre-image of PI uh, under the map from H to C. So remember what H was. H was the collection of all lines contained in some quadric. If we are at the parabolic point, the quadric is a cone. It's a three-dimensional quadric in P4, which is a cone with one vertex. It's a cone over a two-dimensional quadric which is a surface in P3. A two-dimensional quadric is a P1 cross P1. It has two rulings. So there are two families of lines in a cone. And so Ri1 corresponds to one of them, Ri2 corresponds to the other one. These are these 10 divisors. And, okay, I haven't told you how to, to say which one is two, which one is one. We'll talk about this afternoon. Uh, I think this is a good place to stop, um, then, so at least I've explained the basic geometry, and then this afternoon I'll try to explain to you how to actually construct everything and prove the Hecke property. For a few questions? Yeah. Par H at the slice of affine Grassmannian? I don't know. I mean, I'm just speculating. But the no, no, no. I mean, uh, this is something that that. Um, okay. Mm. This is not something that you see from the uh, uh, um, from the optical picture because this really depends on stability. You know, if you do the stack, the Hecke correspondence is actually smooth. Mm -hmm. The fibers are the closures of the minus orbits in affine Grassmannian, actually smooth. So none of this geometry appears there. This geometry is something that reflects the lack of stability, which is something that you cannot see in the, in the local uniformization of the moduli space, of the moduli stack. You really need to impose a global condition, which is stability, and then, uh, uh, and then you can see it. Excellent. Other questions? So for the D module, uh, what does the wobbly divisor mean? Uh, is the eigen D module somehow supported on the wobbly divisor? Well, one thing that, that uh, um, uh, 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 it happens, uh, but you need a, a reason for that. I mean, you, you know, it's not obvious that it happens, is that on the complement of the wobbly divisor, the twisting of the D module disappears for all possible residues. You know, 
the, the twisting is supported on some divisor, and inside the Picard group of your moduli space, the components of the wobbly divisor generate enough so that that divisor is eaten up. Uh, but, you know, that's not something obvious. It's something that actually happens and you need to prove it in general. Um, in the... Uh, in the... And let me just point out that, that this reason that I just gave you, it's only valid when my eigenvalue was a parabolic object, so that, you know, my eigenshift was twisted. But if I start with the unramified question, where the, my, my eigenvalue has no ramification whatsoever, then the wobbly divisor still matters in this strategy because um, <clears throat> the... Um, the, 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 the non-abelian Hodge correspondence, uh, you know, has to start with, uh, uh, in order to convert your D module to a twister D module and then that twister D module to a, to, to a, to a Higgs bundle, you, need, you, need, you have necessarily singularities. And from the construction, you know, if you think about the Langlands correspondence as a Fourier Mukai conjugated by two non-abelian Hodge correspondences, you know that things are going to blow up exactly where the map from the Hitchin fiber to the moduli stack is not proper. And that's the wobbly divisor. So that's, that's the, way, uh, 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 the, the way you see that it, it, uh, um, it appears. So from, uh, uh, from the point of view of the Fukai category, it's completely clear. It's just the locus where the family floor theory uh, uh, jumps. So fa family floor homology is not upper semi, it's, it's not con continuous, it's upper semi continuous. So there is a locus where it actually jumps. That's the wobbly locus. Uh, and, you know, from the D-module point of view, it's the locus where the D-module is actually not smooth. But, you know, it's not smooth generically, right? Sometimes, accidentally, it can happen to be smooth there. So it's not a statement that you can make for one eigenshift at a time, it's a statement that you are making for all eigenshifts at the same time. Uh, other questions? Okay, I don't see any hands. So let's thank the speaker.